Hello everyone and thank you for joining us. Today we'll be talking about ransomware. To set the stage for our discussion, a recent study conducted by ExtraHop named Cyber Confidence Index, which included 500 security and IT decision makers in the US, UK, France, and Germany, finds that leaders are highly confident about their organization's IT security readiness, but admissions of lax security practices combined with startling data about the frequency of ransomware attacks indicate that the confidence may be misplaced. Those lax security practices include the continued use of decades-old network protocols known to be used by ransomware. They also include high numbers of unmanaged devices, leaving critical data and IT resources exposed. To gain a deeper understanding of these findings, I have the great pleasure of hosting Eric Jeffrey again, a veteran regional solutions engineer who will also share his thoughts with us and offer some key tips for network and security team leaders on how to prepare for their next ransomware attack and what actions to take while undergoing one. As a way of introduction, Eric is a regional solutions engineer for AlgoSec with a special focus on application and network security. He has over 30 years of information technology experience with over 25 in information security. During his professional tenure, Eric has worked for major firms such as IBM, Agilent Technologies, HP, and Lockheed Martin. He consistently speaks at various cybersecurity industry conferences, has published nearly three dozen articles for over 10 publications, and runs his own podcast. So Eric, let's jump right into the findings. According to the study, an alarming number of organizations have experienced ransomware attacks. Some have even been hit twice. What can you tell us? about the overarching common denominator of these victims that causes them to get attacked more than once and what they're doing wrong. The common denominator with these organizations is that they're on the internet, that they have network connectivity and that's it. Ransomware, criminals, they're going to go after anybody and they're going to hit the weakest people. And you made a comment, a very good one, about the use of insecure network protocols there are numerous technological deficiencies and procedural problems that occur and exist that enable the criminals to attack. And they're going to keep attacking anybody that's online. They're going to go where the money is. That's why healthcare has hit so heavily. Recently, I've seen some pretty tragic uh, ransomware attacks with schools, particularly the LA Unified School District and uh, children have their data taken and a lot of it is about ransomware and extortionware where they're where the criminals are basically saying give us money or we're going to release this and now going after schools school districts are known to be relatively insecure for a number of reasons and they are funded by the government which means that there's bottomless pockets and the attackers are going to go after them and when Los Angeles did not pay, they released the information. And that is going to put a chilling effect on other organizations, whether it is a, a educational facility or a hospital or uh, an insurance firm or a bank or whomever. When they start to see more and more data released due to lack of payment and lack of punishment and accountability for the attackers, the attacks will continue. And as we've seen them getting worse, I think that that will just keep happening. And what this Cyber Confidence Index shows to me is basically cognitive dissonance where people are saying everything is hunky dory when in reality is they're getting attacked again and again and they're ignoring the bad because of the good and they're having a complete disconnect between what's really happening that's why i find this study so fascinating is from the psychological standpoint of people saying hey it's all great when it's raining thundering and lightning outside and and everything is catastrophic but oh no we're all good it's uh you know, it's kind of like the, I don't know, the flamingo or the ostrich that puts its head in the sand. Um, we need to shine the light on what's happening. And that's why I appreciate you having me back to discuss more cybersecurity uh, situations. Absolutely, Eric. Uh, good to have you on board. So what's the role of these organizations, uh, security teams in response to these this phenomenon? Uh, in reviewing their feedback in, in the study, um, are you getting a sense that they offer any valuable insights? Well, the, to the core of your question about what is the response of the security teams, and they just need to educate leaders and staff, and they need to protect. And those are one and the same. 
education is power, knowledge is power. The more knowledgeable an organization, the more powerful the organization. Cybersecurity goes beyond firewalls, intrusion protection, and other security tools. We need to know what's happening. October happens to be Cybersecurity Awareness Month, and we are halfway through it, and I completely forgot, and I do this for a living. And I only found out about it because my wife is also in cyber, and she was actually leading a training session for end users at her company. That's perfect. That's what we have to do. I believe every day is Cybersecurity Day, and people need to understand and take action regularly and not action. How many emails now do we see at the top, a red bar, alert, this is an untrusted person? Well, we're having to flash that in front of people because we're not treating it as though we treat a seatbelt. We all wear a seatbelt in the car. It's just human nature. I can't even drive without a seatbelt on. And not clicking on a link in, in an email that I don't know about is the same thing as putting on my seatbelt. It's that natural to me. I don't click on that link. And we need to educate people. And so the cybersecurity team's job is dual focused. It is training staff. I guess it's three focused. Training the staff, the end users, letting management and leadership know they are more than janitors. They are more than just the people that fix the network when things aren't working. They are the guardians of the enterprise. And they need that leadership to know it and to push it down and have the top down for the propagation of educating and showing that this is important. And then the third thing that they're responsible for is the technology in and of itself. And I kind of think it's a little bit in that order. If we educate people and they don't click on that link, we don't need to worry so much about having the tools that we have in place. We need the tools still, but we need people not to click or we need people not to give out their username and password as just happened at Uber of all places. An employee was tricked through text messages to give up their confidential username and password. That's totally on education. So between educating the end users, teaching leadership and having them understand that we need the money, we need the training, we need the funding, and we need the tools. And oh, by the way, we're now going to deploy the tools and we're going to deploy the tools thoroughly, accurately, and completely, and not just do a couple of use cases and then move on to the next bigger, better deal. I see that a lot of times where security and IT organizations just want to play with the tools or they're like, let me get this tool for this piece and leave the rest of it alone. And then they're going to jump into something else. And then you have gaps. And I think that that's a big part of the reason why there's a disconnect because leadership is saying, hey, I bought all these tools. I got network guys. I got security guys. They all know what's going on. They're deploying all these tools. But then we see that they're still running SMB version one and HTTP and five-year-old hardware, and they're not patching vulnerabilities. And I think that may be why there's a disconnect. Leadership is seeing one thing, and these IT decision makers are the ones that answer the survey. And the IT and the security and the networking people are the ones deploying it. And they're what I, the Gropos, the ground pounders, you know, the first guys in, the first gals in. They're the ones that are doing it. And the disconnect, I believe, is between what leadership believes they bought and what technology has deployed and what the end users know and how the end users are behaving. So it's a long way around the answer to your question about what the purpose of the security teams are. I think they're huge. And there are those three main ones. So hopefully that answers the question. Great, Eric. Uh, now, we all know that in order to tackle these challenges head on uh, and avert uh, future ransomware attacks, you also need sufficient and skillful staff on hand. Where do you see organizations investing more? Uh, is it closing skill set gaps with existing staff or increasing overhead? That's a typical one, especially in the economic climate we're in. I've already seen a number of instances where organizations are cutting back on spending. They're cutting expenses for internal use. And one of the first things, that, the first thing to go is travel. The second thing to go is training. And I'm concerned that as we're seeing more and more attacks, we're going to start to see less and less training because organizations have to decide where they're going to put their dollars. And as the dollars dwindle, <clears throat> excuse me, we're going to have a bit of an issue. Over the last few years, we've seen massive increases in salary. And I mean, I'm an example of it. I left one organization to go to another one, not for money. However, the money was there because the, uh, the economy was so hot for people in our role. As people job hop, it affects the intellectual capital of an organization. So that was a hindrance. Now, people aren't going to be hopping as much because the hiring is getting frozen and the money's not going to be there. So that's a good thing for keeping the intellectual property, the intellectual capital, I should say. Tribal knowledge is a term for it. That's a good thing. The bad thing is 
there's not going to be as much training going around. And I think that that could be a problem. So how do we avert future ransomware? We train, we prepare, we implement, and we continue down the journey of cybersecurity. That's another thing I saw in the survey where individuals were saying, oh, we're good. I think it was 35% of the people said, we're in better shape because we've patched our vulnerabilities. And so we're not concerned anymore. And I was sitting there reading that going, how can you say that? Vulnerabilities happen every day, especially Patch Tuesday. You know, we get new patches and new patches bring new risks and new software comes out and new versions. And with CI, CD pipelines and DevSecOps releasing code so quickly, it's fantastic. But the more code, the more releases, the more vulnerabilities, the more vulnerabilities, the more happenstance or capability there is for an attacker to attack. It's a never ending cycle. It's a journey. And we need to understand that. So, you know, back to the original question of how do we tackle it? Be diligent. Be focused, deploy the proper tools, use the tools, support the organization, keep your staff, train your staff, support your staff, and have a an entirely inclusive, defensive environment, if you will. Okay, good. Uh, so let's talk about uh, risk management from a personnel point of view. Generally speaking, uh, we need to accept that mistakes are going to be made and organizations should expect this as well. However, it seems that the level one teams are most prone to making mistakes since they are the most inexperienced personnel on the staff. So what can organizations do to shore up their level one teams to help minimize their mistakes? It goes back a little bit to what we were saying before, and that is training them. But I think it's also about supporting. There's more to training than sitting in a class for six or eight hours in a day and doing lab work and reading. You can have training from mentors. It's one of the things that I do a lot of. It's why I run my podcast. It's why I do talks like this. And even when new employees join the company, I tell them, I'm here to help you. I'm here to mentor you. I want to guide you. My daughter's 24 and she told her colleagues, don't reinvent the wheel. Talk to those that came before us. Learn from them so you don't repeat their mistakes. That's what I want to do as a, a co-worker, as a colleague. So mentorships, there needs to be a focus for us older folks working with younger folks. And I don't just mean younger in age, I also mean younger in skill. I talked to a gentleman last week, fantastic person that I'm working with, he's a customer. He's 38 years old and he has six years experience. That's a dichotomy. Usually if you're 38, you have 15 years experience. But my friend here, he was in the military for a while. He was a carpenter and now he's a network security engineer and he's really good. So I asked him his age because he knows so much and I wanted to know why. And after we talked, I realized that as an electrician in the Navy, he had to do a lot of critical thinking and a lot of scientific deduction. And he was very capable and he succeeded greatly in taking those skills and bringing them into cybersecurity. I want to mentor him and I want him to mentor other people that want to make that shift. Other things that we can do for the tier one folks, give them more automation. I was just on a call with a major oil and gas firm earlier today, and they literally said that we have too many typos. We have too many human errors and we want to automate. We want a zero touch mechanism to go from a change request to an implementation. And they needed our companies assistance in automating a very technical component for a cloud integration. We need more of that, the zero touch. Another thing that we can do for the young folks, something Ronald Reagan said, trust but verify. We shouldn't just delegate to an individual, please go do A, B, and C. And then next week or the next day or the next hour, go do D, E, and F. Go back and check at least A, if not A, B, and C. Verify what they've done. And I believe in a carrot and stick approach. I think that we need to give people positive reinforcement and we also need to hold them accountable. On another personal note, I made a mistake yesterday in a conversation and a colleague of mine reached out and said, hey, Eric, great meeting. A couple things were said, maybe shouldn't have been. And I appreciated that. Even at my age, I make mistakes. And when my colleague and friend came and said something, he educated me. He gave me a little bit of stick and a little bit of carrot. Good job, Eric. But, and I appreciate that and we need that. And then the last thing, security is bottom down and top up. So not only do we need to guide, mentor, verify, train our younger friends and our younger colleagues, we need to listen to them and have them help us understand. If you do what you've always done, you're going to get what you've always had. The younger staff see things in a different light. As a newer employee at my company, at Algosec, I say things based off what I knew before. 
we get that with the newer employees. But from the younger ones, you know, I was in college or I was in a team group or, you know, my friends and I do these types of things. Bring in that information. And that's a big carrot approach. If we just look at tier one and look down on tier one and make people think that, well, you're tier one because you don't know any better, that's a detriment to them, their morale, and to the organization. We need to lift up the tier one and let them know we're here to help you, to train you, to guide you, to mentor you. And we need you and your fresh eyes and your fresh approach. Because if we do what we've always done, we're going to get what we've always had. You know what we've always had? Breaches, breaches, breaches. Well, maybe there's some youth out there that have ideas, visions, perceptions that can help us help me, help you, help the companies change our mindset and finally get over the hurdle and push back on the attackers. Okay, great. So now let's talk about infrastructure. You know, according to the study, outdated infrastructure is another big contributor to the reason why organizations are getting hit multiple times. So what's the role of leadership here in overcoming this challenge? Well, again, it goes back to what I was saying before, and that's money. Money support, understanding, acknowledgement. I've said this before, and it's very true, and that is that defenders have to be right 100% of the time, and attackers only need to be right once. And throwing money at it is not necessarily the solution. Providing enough resources to update infrastructure, to migrate to more secure environments. One of the things in the study, I think it said 5% of the organizations surveyed have between 76 and 100% of their devices unmanaged. And I know businesses like that. They're smaller, maybe 15 or 20 employees. They just say, use your own laptop. I even have that. One of my children works in a financial services industry. Her firm said, go buy your own computer. Now they use Citrix and she connects and they have VPN, but maybe there are better, more secure ways to handle that than having somebody using their own computer. With infrastructure, going to the cloud is a phenomenal solution. That's one of the main benefits of cloud is you don't need to worry about updating the software because they do it. You don't need to worry about upgrading the hardware because it's all in the cloud. It's one of the reasons why Agosec is going to software as a service. We want to provide capabilities to our customers and alleviate strain, cost, pressure, stress, and risk through cloud. So that is a main way to do it. The other way is just going to be a tried and true Every three years, you refresh. And some people say that's too much. We don't need to do it, but every five years, we can't afford it. The learning curve on the change for the people, now they've got a Windows 10 machine, soon will be Windows 11, hits productivity, we don't wanna do it. If you don't make the necessary investments, you're gonna continue with what we've seen, and those are ransomware attacks and other types of viruses and other threats. So in the end, when it comes to infrastructure, organizations need to understand where they can find security benefits, where they can reduce their attack surface, and where they can improve their security maturity by partnering with managed security service providers, outsourced hardware vendors, co-location facilities that handle certain components of the security, or cloud, GCP with Google, Microsoft Azure, Amazon's AWS, those organizations, those companies, those are critical and key and capable ways to mitigate infrastructure risk. Hopefully that answers your question. Yeah, makes sense, makes perfect sense. <clears throat> also, according to the study, Eric, uh, there seems to be a, a glaring disconnect. You know, 77% of the respondents said they were very confident, yet 85% said they have experienced at least one ransomware attack in the last five years. So this begs the question, what does good actually look like? Yeah, this is a difficult question because I'm a perfectionist and I would say good looks like never getting breached. That's not realistic. I think that good is, you know, it's when an organization does what they say. It's when an organization understands that security is not just about checking the boxes. I have seen for decades, I can't believe I'm saying that, but yes, for decades, I've seen businesses that have a regulatory checklist or they have an auditor that comes in and says, you need to do this. You need to have disaster recovery. Now, it's not even necessarily a security component, but I'm going to use that. It's a good example. And you can extrapolate that to the security. Auditor comes in and says, you need to have disaster recovery. What does that mean? You need to have a second copy of your data somewhere. Okay. I'm going to back it up to tape and take it home. I check that box. 
All right, fine. Well, what happens if you leave the company? Now you have all the private data that violates HIPAA, that violates SOX. You can't just take the data home. And yet I literally have had the CIO say to me, I have a backup. I copy it to another machine and I take the tapes and I take them home. And I'm like, okay, if that helps him sleep at night, but totally a violation. He was healthcare, total HIPAA problem. But their point was, I checked the box. Other times I'll have people say, I want to have a high availability solution, but I never test it. Or I have a cold standby in the corner, but we don't bring it up. Or I have backups and I don't restore them to test to see, but I check that box. So my point in the answer is what does good look like? It looks like doing more than checking a box. Good looks like doing what needs to be done, checking it, validating it, and verifying it, and then continuing down the path of, great, I did this, what's next? And if it's something as simple as hardening a firewall, and you have an SSH timeout of 15 minutes, and then you move on and you set up a banner, and then you move on and you go ahead and configure um, SSL only and only from certain IPs and make it harder and harder to get in, that's doing more than just the checkbox. Because the auditor is just saying, do you have a banner and do you have an SSL timeout? Yeah. Well, is it seven minutes? Is it 17 minutes? There are guidelines that are out there, and I think organizations and individuals look at the guideline as a map. Oh. If I need to do this, I'm at that destination, I'm done. You said it before and I'll say it again. We're not talking about a destination. Security is not a destination, it's a journey. And good understands that. Great performs that. People get breached. Breaches happen, breaches will happen. And for people that say I haven't been breached, honestly, I would sit here and say, you're probably breached right now and don't even know it. The IBM cost of a data breach survey says that it takes nine months to purge an attack. I think seven of those months are finding it and then another two months to purge it. I know there are some instances, and I think it was Equifax, I'm pretty sure that this is correct, may not have been, four years. Organizations have been breached for four years. So good looks like less than nine months and certainly less than four years. We need to understand that we are probably breached and we need to search for it. That's where threat hunting comes in. That's a little bit off topic. They didn't talk about that here. Maybe that's a future conversation, but getting a bit more advanced and instead of playing defense and waiting for something, going out and looking in your environment, that's what great looks like. Understanding that there's more out there than you know about and acknowledging it and getting away from the cognitive dissonance that I mentioned before and that this survey proves, realize I have a problem. The first step in any problem is acknowledgement. Acknowledge you have a cybersecurity problem and now move forward and take the steps to be good and then move on and be great. First thing, guidelines are not maps. It is not a destination. It is a journey. And focus on those aspects and then create a holistic cybersecurity program around that and protect the environment, protect your employees, protect your customers and protect your data. Great tips there, Eric. The study also only focused on reported ransomware attacks. Um, so how concerned should organizations be about other attacks? <laughs> Extremely. Uh, I, I touched on this a little bit in the last one. It's an iceberg. And th th I have a big picture in my mind. It's a meme, a beautiful iceberg, the white tip and just blue underneath in the water. And that's really where we are. One of the things that I don't like hearing is, and this came out with the LA Unified School District, I believe. We we're attacked a billion times a day and we're doing everything we can to stave off the attacks. That's misleading. They're, they're not being attacked a billion times a day. They're getting ports scanned and a billion ports are being hit, but that's not an attack per se. They find an opening and they get in and you're breached fine. Be afraid, be extremely concerned. What's out there, you're only hearing a little bit about. One of the things that the survey also says is that they ask, should you disclose when you've been attacked? And by a two to one margin, they say yes, but that still leaves one third of all attacks. They are like, we don't want to talk about it. And as a matter of fact, I know this for certainty because I, this I remember. The LA Unified School District, they were told by individuals that they went to, both government and private sector, but government in particular, do not disclose how the breach occurred. I have a problem with that. We need to share what's going on because the attackers are talking, the defenders need to talk. We need to have this information out there. For the third of the people that wanna keep it private, you can't keep it private because your prospects are impacted, your customers are impacted. Cover-ups are the problem. You know What, what Nixon did with Watergate, that was an issue, but he got impeached because of the cover-up. We need to stop covering up cyber attacks. We need to step up and say, 
I'm sorry. I'm embarrassed. We made a mistake. It happened. Uber did that. Twitter did that back two years ago. I'm not a Twitter fan, but I was so impressed with how Twitter handled their breach. That was perfect. This is what happened. This is who did it. This is how it happened. This is what we're doing to prevent it. And above all else, we are sorry. Good Twitter. Everybody needs to do that. So we need to be concerned and focused on more than ransomware. We need to acknowledge that we have a problem and we need to go ahead and solve the problem as a journey. So I don't know if it'll ever be solved. I just, I just don't. Just like car accidents will never be solved. Seatbelts certainly help. Seatbelts save lives. Cybersecurity saves data. And we need to go and look at it from that perspective. There's still going to be car accidents, but seatbelts will help. There will still be cyber attacks. But having proper incident response procedures and proper um, marketing and public relations. People say to me, well, who needs to be involved in cyber? The entire company, your legal, your HR, your public relations, your marketing. And when we sit here and I say that the cyber attacks, we're seeing the tip of the iceberg. Everybody in the organization needs to be involved. Everybody needs to know what's going on. Everybody needs to be educated and organizations have to have comprehensive incident response plans and notify when there's a data breach. I'm not saying anytime you're getting court scanned, you don't need to talk about that. But if you have data exfiltrated or you have individuals that are even in your environment that have seen that data, that's a breach and that needs to be disclosed. And I want to know how it happened. My most recent podcast was on um, cybersecurity attacks in the news. And I struggled this year. When I did it last year, I was able to find out how it happened. I knew about the Twitter. I, kind of, I knew about the Uber. But a number of these attacks that I found, nobody was disclosing what happened. So now we're all left to assume that it's a phishing attack. But a phishing attack just means somebody clicked on a link. I want to know that clicking on that link downloads some software. Are you now a command and control bot? Or do you have a key logger on your system? Did somebody get passwords? What exactly happened? Because we in the cyber world need to know so we can check and see if our organization has a defense against it. Having a ransomware and a URL, a SIM will help you with that. Proxy servers will help you with connecting to external systems. And there's a lot of other tools that are out there. But if organizations don't know exactly what occurred, they're not sure whether A, they own the tool or B, if they have that feature of the tool turned on. And this is why we need to share not only that you were breached, how you were breached. I'm not even as concerned as to the number of breaches. So when Capital One was breached, they said 100 million users were affected. As a cyber person, I don't really care about that. On the business and the legal side and the PR side, they're going to be concerned. I want to know how Capital One was breached. And we know it was an inside job on a WAF that was poorly configured. That information has to get out there. Again, back to your original question, it is because of people needing to be extremely concerned. It is an iceberg. There's so much out there. There's so much going on and there's too much quiet. We need to share. That's the best I got on that one. Terrific, Eric. Uh, so this will do it for today's episode. I want to thank our guest, Eric Jeffrey. Um, Eric has been terrific in providing us uh, some great insights, uh, taking us through this very important study and helping us better prepare for the next ransomware attack. Um, I also want to thank our audience for joining us today. Stay tuned for our next podcast episode. Right. Thanks, Ami. 